Welcome to the Recovery Lab podcast. We're glad you were able to join us. Recovery Lab hopes to destigmatize addiction and normalize recovery. Our platform provides an avenue to share the many stories of those that have recovered from addiction, providing for the listener the most basic antidote to addiction hope. <laughs> Oh, right, right. <laughs> we got a show to do. Go ahead. <laughs> it's easy to listen to. All right, everybody, we're back. This is episode number 69 <laughs> of the Recovery Lab podcast series. Oh. We're here to bring not only inappropriate jokes about, you know, that 15 year olds would like, but episode 69. Uh, uh, I'm Drew Hassan. I'm Daniel Anderson. We are the Recovery Lab. <laughs> so appealing to Daniel's and my innate sense of narcissism, we're going to speak to <laughs> our hour today about what you should do in your own life and how your life will be made better if only you listen to us. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> A solid hour of it. This is gold. <laughs> Active audience, <laughs> just me and you. <laughs> Holy moly, we got we got four thousand seven hundred and sixty-two people watching this right now. We should. How about that? That's four thousand people that are blessed. <laughs> oh no, it's a blessing in your <laughs> life right now. What is wrong with us? What is wrong with us? All right, I got it. We got it. We got it. We got to focus in, here. All in right. All honesty, though, today's episode is born out of some genius that we learned last week from Christina Dent. Yes. She wants to help people develop a life that is engaging enough, enriched enough, good enough, pleasant enough that the person would be driven to be present for that life. Yeah. I mean, that's what it's all about, bro. Like the, my whole addiction was me trying to change how I felt and me trying to be something that I wasn't because I didn't like who I was. Right. And sobriety has given me a life that I don't feel like I don't feel the need to numb in order to get through the day. Right. It's, it's, I mean, my life has fundamentally changed for the better as a result of getting sober. Everything is better. Everything is okay. Now, you know, every day is not rainbows and, and butterflies and all that, but you know what they say, you know, my, my best day in active addiction is nowhere near my worst day sober. And I heard people say that all the time, and I was like, these people are idiots. I had a tremendous amount of fun when I was high. There yeah, was I lots of times when I had a lot of fun high, and I didn't believe these people. I think this is where you and are willing to depart from the, the crowd. Drugs are an option. Yeah, absolutely. Using is a solution. It's a horrible one that comes with consequences. Right. But if you are only... Can you, am I close enough to them? Am I doing good? Yeah, yeah, you're good. If you're only interested in the calculus about the short gain, the short game, then you're, you're going to give the path of, well, I could always use drugs a lot more credence than if you're willing to expand out your analysis yeah. about what will, what will yield you better results. Right. And uh, al- drugs and alcohol the reason that I used them was because they worked. Yeah. They were a solution. They were a solution they for a very long time. Yeah, it. absolutely. They were, there, was a, there was a net gain when I was high. Unfortunately, you know, there's also consequences that, that went along with those actions. And you know, eventually those consequences will catch up if, if you're like me. And they, they caught up with me pretty aggressively. And it was unpleasant. So the, the drugs and alcohol were a solution. That's why we use drugs and alcohol is because they work. They, they change how we feel. They, they make us feel yeah. different. L- let me give you a brief story. So this is how, something that happened in my personal life recently. So one of Kimberly's friends relapsed and we were engaged in uh, trying to assist this person. And I was talking to Kimberly and I said, you know, imagine you know, that was your life. 
and you had made a couple of bad choices, you know, and imagine you're holed up in a motel. And do you think you could get high enough to blot out the guilt right. that would come with knowing that you didn't have to choose this path? And, you know, you can get high enough to blot out your misery, yeah. but eventually you have to keep getting high to such a degree, a continuous degree that really all you're going to do is end up ODing. Right. I mean, that that's the only, that's the only end of this story. Right. I've now been sober long enough. Kimberly's now been sober long enough. You have now been sober long enough that there's no way to be halfway using drugs for us because we know better. You know, the thing you hear in AA is a head full of AA and a belly full of beer doesn't mix. No, but not at all. Not at all. You know, and for us who have had some of the promises and benefits come true, right? And our lives have improved, we would know, yeah, that we were wrong. There, w- there wouldn't be any, well, you know, figuring out some way to justify it or mitigate the poor decision we've made. It would come full circle. Oh, yeah, absolutely. But don't, don't be, you know, deceived i tried i tried my damnedest i tried every every imaginable way to you know just you know just smoking weed in the morning and then a little bit of meth in the evening or or you know no meth in the morning no meth in the evening a gentleman doesn't do meth before noon thank you thank you but maybe just just eat a little shard around lunch but maybe just it, afternoon you had it with food so <laughs> right 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 so I, I i tried it all man and like the whole story in the big book about you know the the whiskey and milk you know one of my one of my clients podcasts is you know the whiskey milk podcast whiskey and it's milk podcast. it's it's a thing like we try every imaginable way because we don't want to admit defeat and sure. what we found out was when we admit defeat over the drugs and alcohol and I can only speak for myself when I admit defeat over drugs and alcohol and when I made a decision that, okay, I'm powerless over this and I need some help. It was at that moment that God recognized that willingness and took me by the hand and, and, and led me through the, the, the path of early sobriety, but it, it, it took what it took. And I tried everything, man, every, you know, drugs and alcoholics, you know, drug addicts and alcoholics, we're supremely creative individuals, the the vast majority of us. And we're going to, we're going to, you know, we're going to figure out a way to, to do it our way a- until we hit our head against the wall mm-hmm. time and time again, if you're anything like me. And, and then you finally get to a point where, wow, there's no other options. And then I, you know, tuck my tail between my legs and crawled into AA and said, I can't do anything right. And they're like, welcome. We love you. And they loved me until I could love myself. Amen. Well, in furtherance of today's discussion, I took some, I made some notes. I really thought about this. Okay. So the idea being that by discussing this with you, it not only reinforces these things in my own mind, but it also allows the listener to benefit from my own consequences and in my own my own consequences. Yeah, of course. You know, cause I've, I've screwed my life up in fantastic fashion yeah, and have cobbled together a good life now. Yeah. So number one in building a life for which you want to be present sober, you've got to stay sober. Yeah. Okay. And that's number one. Yeah. That's easy enough to grasp. We're a recovery promoting podcast. Look, there's no cheating around the edges. You can't eat Valium after the AA meeting. <laughs> To spot, you know, I tried that. <laughs> You've got to really give in. Right? Right. No drugs and alcohol. Yeah. Next, you've got to figure out a way to develop meaning in your life. Mm-hmm. Okay. What I came up with for number one here, or number two, besides sober, I feel like this is usually brought on by spiritual endeavors. You know, the reason that people generally gravitate towards organized religion is that it gives you the framework by which you would operate your spiritual growth. Right. It gives you the rules. I mean, we're in Mississippi. The majority of people here are Christians. 
Christianity comes with its own set of rules and it comes with its own beliefs and it helps you get through the tough parts of life because you have the revealed truth of Christianity behind you and you say, okay, why am I going through this tough time? Well, that's because God willed it. And then, you know, that is your kind of, that is the scaffolding of on which you build your spiritual practice. Sure. You can do this without adherence to some organized religion, but it's tougher because you have to cobble together your own rules. Right. And you have to try on, you know, you have to buy a little bit from Buddhism and buy a little bit from Hinduism and buy a little bit from Christianity, Judaism, you know, Native American spiritual beliefs, whatever. And then you cobble together your own belief system. Right. So develop meaning. Spiritual practice will certainly help with that that you are operating in a way to fulfill obligations that are greater than you. That is largely what the spiritual practice of recovery is about, Right, is that there is a higher good and you are appealing to that higher good being in, it comes with, you know, you, you dedicate yourself to principles that are, Beyond you. Something bigger. Something bigger. Selflessness, forgiveness, that sort of thing. That's why we do 12-step work. Right. We help the next man because we were helped in furtherance of these selfless endeavors. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Okay. What do you think about this so far? Well, one thing that that's just screaming to me is how grateful I am about the fact that you know, you, you mentioned spiritual a lot, but you didn't mention religious. And that is a huge thing for me. And, you know, there's there's even jokes about, you know, well, there's a, a family guy episode where Peter asks God, do 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 people that say they're spiritual, not religious, do they go hell? Go, do they go to hell? And God's like, Yes, straight to hell, straight to hell, straight, straight to hell. There. And I chuckled about that because, you know, I I am T- to me, organized religion is a beautiful thing. It's it's lovely. It it creates like you sp- like you spoke about a, a, a framework by which to, to yeah. It to gives build. you all your rules, right? Right. But here's the deal: man is broken. I don't care what church you're affiliated with, what denomination. It's going to be led by a man, and men are broken and sinners. So. Any organized religion, you know, I, I, enough with these overgeneralization words, any, all, never, whatever. But a, a lot of churches are, despite their best efforts, you know, their leaders are but men, right? And and they men succumb to their character defects. Exactly, exactly. So what what is so beautiful for me and why I really latched on to the the 12-step program that that I'm affiliated with now that is one letter before B, B, for those that are curious. But what what I love about that most is you are, it is okay for you to believe in a higher power. Now, I personally believe in God. I already always have been, but I know that there are, there are people out there that it, when, when they're trying to get sober, they're at their lowest point and they're struggling like they've never struggled before and they don't feel like God loves them. They don't feel like they feel like God has abandoned them or they don't believe in God altogether. And they walk into a, a you know, say like a, a celebrate recovery thing and all they're hearing is, you know, you, you got to love God. You got to give your life to God. Well, those people out the door mm-hmm. immediately and with great vigor out the door immediately. So what I love about the 12 step program that I'm affiliated with is we throw all that out there, out, out, out the window, right? You do not have to believe in anything other than something that's greater than yourself. And that opens the door for those people, for all people, all walks of life, people that are atheists, agnostic, had history of Christianity. I had such a heart with the God thing in the beginning. Yeah. It really... Listen, everybody who might be listening to this, consternation or objection to God in the AA program or 12-step sense is a fool's errand. 
you don't have to believe in God. It certainly doesn't have to be the God of your youth right. and the church that you resent. And that ideology don't even cuts people off. It does. Just don't don't go grow trouble in that area where trouble need not be grown. Right. Like th- there's no controversy here. You don't have to believe in any particular thing. Right. Just get on board with something is greater than you. Right. This is an easy concept. I Very mean, logically, easy. it bears reason. Yeah. There are powers greater than me that operate throughout the world. Yeah. And and a beautiful example of that is a a, a room in AA, a, a, a sober room, or if yeah. if you know, celebrate recovery or whatever. If God, smart, if you know? God needs to be good, orderly direction or group of drunks or whatever, just find something. Yeah. Find something that is in the spiritual realm and lock on to it. Right. So to go back to your point and your question at this, this long thing that I just did around here, you know, I, I, I am, I am, I love spirituality. I love spiritual things. And I think there is a, a massive distinction between spirituality and things in the spiritual realm and organized religion, organized religion is it can be toxic. Well, it can be. And it's just easier because like I said, it gives you your rules. It yeah. gives you your framework for living and it tells you what's good and what's bad. Absolutely. And I, I right love, I love it. Don't. And it's, it, you know, that the problem is it's going, eventually you're going to find some topic that you disagree with. Yeah. And you're going to have to, the, the organized religion is going to have some rule that you don't agree with. And you're going to be told, well, either you can agree or you're wrong. Yeah. And being wrong usually in an organized religion lands you in eternal damnation. Right. So, I mean, that's the problem with organized religion is if you find something, if there's some belief, some facet of its belief system that you don't agree with, you go to hell. Right. Right. So that's a pretty black and white. People react poorly to that kind of <laughs> imagine that, that crossroad. Yeah. And so taken to its worst, you know, that's dictatorial mm-hmm. and oppressive and theocratic. People, yeah. people don't like that kind of thing. No, no, they tend to, I, I, again, here I go speaking for everyone and I can't do that. But for me, you know, that kind of terminology, those kinds of black and white things that I had to do are conform with in conform order or go to, to hell. Yeah. I mean, you know, I don't do good with that. Nobody um, does. I just, I just didn't. But again, let me reassure everybody. The, this is what Drew believes and Drew's matrix for operating in a sober life that helps me continue to have a life that I value enough that I want to do everything I can not to use drugs or to drink. Right. A life that I want to be present for. Absolutely. Next on my list of helpful benefits here, track your positive accomplishments. Mm -hmm. So AA working the steps, you will not be, you will not, there's no lack of opportunities to point out the things that you're doing wrong. Yeah. You're, you know, you're going to feel pretty guilty when you get sober because you've probably been lying, cheating, and stealing. Like, I don't know what. Right. You're going to get a sponsor. That sponsor is going to help you identify the problem areas in your behavior and your thought processes. You know, you're going to work on your character defects. Hopefully, if you're doing what you're supposed to do, you will do a fourth step, you know, where you take your moral inventory. You'll do a fifth step where you tell somebody. And that's going to be black and white. It's going to, the inescapable outcome of doing a proper fourth step is the common denominator for all of your problems and your resentments is you, right? You are the star in every story that you have in your fourth step, right? Like that was the thing I could not believe. I mean, it really, it's there writ large for you to see in the, you know, you've got your columns and your resentments and everything. My part, and, what my part was. And the one common thread through all of it is you. Right. You were there probably fucking up. Yeah, that's a big pill to It's to a big swallow pill to too. swallow, but there's, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, and, you know, the, the four step for me, you know, the, the blame game is 
society is is really in love with it you know it's not my fault it's this fault it's yeah. it's well uh, it was it, a right man. you know right and you you're misgendering it's me like, like it's yeah. your fault it's your fault right. there's no accountability taken no. today well no. uh, again with the overgeneralization there is often an alarming lack of it there you go there you go so what what the the fourth and fifth step did for me was like you said, it was black and white. Boom. It's right there in front of me. If you're thorough with it, which, you know, if you don't do a fourth, you're going to pick up the fifth is what my first sponsor always told well, me. So it's it, true. It's very important to be thorough on this, but you know, it, it, it was, it was important for me to, to begin. It all didn't change when I did my fifth step, but I began to really start to identify, Oh, Bad things have happened in my life, but had I not done this, this, and this, I would have never been in this situation right. where bad things happen. So it it allowed me to kind of reset my mind that, oh, oh, shh, it this is it, my fault. It helps you trace the causation chain of events that led to the undesirable circumstances. Yeah. And we are so good at not tracing the causation chain of circumstances. Yeah, absolutely. Back to something that we did. Mm -hmm. We never want the genesis of the problem to start with something we did. Right. So we'll start, you know, we'll creep up a little bit. Right, right. <laughs> I'm the victim. Yeah. And that victim mentality, you got it. It's got to go. So it's got to go. And the flip side to that is, you know, you're going to be faced with a number of opportunities to, to understand that you did wrong. Right. Okay. You did something that you shouldn't have done or, you know, in a more pleasant light, you learned something about the way that you behave and now you can hopefully behave differently in the future. Right. So the flip side to all this is track your positive accomplishments. When something works out well, be quick to link that with your new sober life. Absolutely. So here is a great example. I'm living in Hattiesburg and I got a job and somebody took me to go get a driver's license. And man, I was so proud to have a physical driver's <laughs> license because yeah. I didn't have one. Yeah. And I thought, okay. And it really struck me as something positive that I could link directly to being sober and working a program of recovery, because despite my desire to have a driver's license while I was using, I never could seem to make it to the driver's license place. Right. Surely I would have been arrested immediately upon entering. <laughs> I mean, that I was under, yeah. you know, that I was under the influence and likely had something illicit on me was apparent to everyone. Right. <laughs> And you know who you are out there. If you're a needle junkie, everybody knows. Yeah. Everybody knows. Even the little old lady who doesn't do drugs at the Walmart that saw you. Most definitely the little old lady at the Walgreens. <laughs> that something's wrong with you. So track your positive accomplishments. I got the driver's license that a couple of weeks later, I opened up a bank account. There you go. And gleaned enormous reward from feeling that sense of accomplishment. Here I am sober and sobriety is yielding tangible evidence that it works and right. that it is good. I got a driver's license. I got a checking account. I then bought a 20 year old broke down Corolla. That was the greatest vehicle, the single greatest oh, yeah. piece of tangible evidence right. that the sober life is worth living. Right. And I have, those things became the bedrock of my life today. Yeah. And every single time I have a positive, I mean, look, I got indicted while I was sober. Okay. Imagine being sober for two years. You're kind of a good person. Now you've got a steady job and the phone rings and you got indicted. Damn. Damn. <laughs> they got me. <laughs> I mean, I've lived my I lived my life up until then largely able to avoid all consequences right. because I'm pretty clever 
and my parents love me and they're willing to give me money from time to time. And I've avoided all these consequences everybody else has. And now I'm not. Yeah. So, you know, I, because I was sober and I was working a program and I met somebody and I knew somebody and I got on pretrial and I was able to avoid the consequence of a felony conviction. Right. And I was able to avoid the consequence of maybe going to prison. Nobody wants to go to prison. <laughs> it's overrated. It's, <laughs> I can get, I can get ramen noodles on the outside. <laughs> yeah. And you know, it's, it's, I, I love, I love those examples. And, and an example for me is, Literally everything that I'm a part of and I'm involved in literally everything that I have today is because I got sober. Yes. Would I have this studio if I was taking meth, eating meth? Of course, you got to eat it like a gentleman. None of the smoking nonsense or shooting it up like shoot like it an up. animal. You shoot it up like a shit. <laughs> but no, none of this, not none of this, none of this. This would all be at USA Paul. This would still be a storage room for Mister Trey. That's what this would be. I wouldn't have a car. I wouldn't have. I I wouldn't have partner. I wouldn't have a, a son. I wouldn't have anything. I wouldn't have anything. So it's. It's not difficult for me to apply what you just said to my life because literally the first thing that I do every single day since I got sober, April 11th of 20, 2021, I haven't missed a day. I get on my knees when I wake up. I thank God for keeping me sober the day before. I ask that he keep me sober today and that he uses me in some way to be helpful to other people. And that's it. I don't pray for anything. I don't ask him for anything because I'm smart enough to know that I'm an idiot and me left to my own devices. Things are going to go sour pretty, pretty quickly and pretty aggressively. So I just, I ask that his will be done. That's it. That's it. I get on my knees. I show that willingness and, and God, whatever your will is, let that be done. And I kid you not. My life has been incredibly beautiful as a result of doing that. Everything that I have, everything from my, my Walmart boxers to my, you know, my Walmart t-shirt to my nice truck, to the studio, to my business, to audio alchemy productions, it's all because I got sober. Mm -hmm. And if I got sober, I tried for 18 years to get sober. In and out of the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous. In and out. I tried. I would try it my way. I would try this. I would change this a little bit. I would get in some trouble. I'd go back to get out of the trouble. It was just a constant. And honestly, a, a lot of that was just because I was running for myself from some, from some sexual stuff that I was super embarrassed about that, that I was unwilling to look at. I was unwilling to look at it. I'll work on myself with every other aspect, but this one thing, I can't deal with this. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to tell anybody. It's never going to come out. And, and, and if I push it down far enough, right? If I push it down far enough, it's not going to cause me any problems. And for 18 years, it caused me problems. And I would, I would get a little time under my belt and then I would run back out because I couldn't push those feelings down anymore or those, you know, those experiences and what happened. And so it, what, what happened was I had to, I had to get to a point where I was willing to take a, a thorough and complete look at myself and be willing to work on everything about me. We, I feel it. I should say, listen, for people out there, you know, you, you have to go to meetings you have to get a sponsor. You have to do a devotion every day. Yeah, you know, ninety meetings in ninety days. If you're just starting, ninety meetings in ninety days. If you have a tough pot, tough spot in your life, if you need therapy, go to therapy. Yeah, man. Okay. Those things are kind of a given. I didn't really think about that kind of minutia when I was kind of crafting what you know, or contemplating what do I do to help me build this life that I want to be present for. Right. So you certainly. You have to do those things. Absolutely. Yeah. 
Yeah, and it's so it's it's important because you have to have professional help to address some of the things. That... Yeah, oftentimes, oftentimes. So it is to 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 circle back around to your to your point. It it is incredibly important that you begin to recognize how your positive actions have influenced and affected the positive things that are going on in your life. Mm-hmm. But also there's a, there's a caveat caveat to that. Had it, caveat caveat. Thank you. I had a brain fart there. It is very, it, it's not as tempting for me now, but I still struggle with it. It's very easy for me to, and it has been my whole life. When things start going well, it's very easy for me to say, oh, look at me go. Mm -hmm. Look how impressive I am. Look at all of this stuff that I've built. Look at all of this stuff that I've accumulated and I got. It's me, 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 I, I, I. Now, our listeners, viewers, you, you all may be completely different. But for me, when I start thinking that I did something, I am on the fast track to destroying all of those good things. Oh, yeah, absolutely. So it is important for me to stay humble. And immediately when those thoughts come in my head, I immediately go to, okay, well, really? Did you do this? Or, or, or did God open every single door that you've just walked through? Did, did God do that or did you do that? Look, I'm reminded of what my, probably my favorite line in all of recoverydom is in the 12 and 12. And it talks about a life run on self will right. is a bone crushing juggernaut yeah. whose final achievement is ruin. Right. And that's it. Yeah. It is this, this self will self self centered view right. of accomplishment. And I think that's one of the important thing, important facets to having staying rooted in a recovery community so that we, we don't have this ego run amok. Yeah, absolutely. It's, it's very important for me to, to make meetings a, 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 a common thing in my life. I go to a meeting every single morning, you know, is that needed? Probably not, but there's between 40 and 60 people in that Zoom meeting in Dallas, the Preston group that I go to, that all of those people also go every single morning. And guess what? All of those people have pretty long-term sobriety. We have newcomers come in all the time, but there is a core group of individuals who a, 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 a daily meeting is part of their routine and it works for them. I want what works today. So for me, it's important for me to get my rear into a meeting and when those newcomers do come in and they talk about how oh my god my life is just in shambles in shambles now we can I, I can oh i remember how i remember exactly what that felt like that didn't feel good at all let me let me invest in in helping other people a little bit more a little bit more aggressively today so that i don't wind up back in that and and when when i start thinking that again i can't I can't stress this enough. When I start thinking that I'm doing something, I'm on, I, I am, I am in severe danger. So, well, this dovetails nicely with the next component to tracking the positives in your life. I don't want everyone to focus on just the, the tangible things. Yeah. Oh, look at me. I've got a new shiny widget. My, I've now gotten sober because look, you're going to get sober and you're going to have a little more money. It's just the magic of being sober. Yeah you will have more money in your pocket, right. disposable income, and you will you will be fooled into thinking that shiny widgets are good. Right. But, you know, shiny widgets have a, you know, I got a driver's license, I got a checking account, I got a car, I got a better job, I had more things, and that's cool and all. But we can't end our analysis of the benefits there because – if you harness the gratitude that comes from recognizing that I now have these good things because I got sober, then the gratitude will grow the internal positives that are much more meaningful 
than the new shiny toys. Oh, absolutely. When I can be proud of myself for doing something, that's amazing. Yeah. That's not really a feeling that I have been, that I've had a great deal in my adult life Yeah, is actually being proud of something, something that I did that I felt like I built this thing. Right. And I hate that I had to lose so much of what was given to me, what I benefited from by having like a loving and supportive family and, you know, uh, from a solid middle-class family with college educated parents and, you know, they are a meaningful part of my life. And I know that that is a, that's a privilege to have. And I hate that I had to jeopardize so much of my life, but I now feel grateful for that. Right. And I've now harnessed that loss into something that operates to my net good. And you can too. Yeah. And I would suggest figuring out a way to do that. So you recognize the benefits of the things in your life and you stay positive or you track the positives and link those to being in recovery. And then all of a sudden you feel a little more grateful, right? You feel a little more positive. You feel a a little more kind and forgiving of yourself. You feel a little more accepting of yourself. And that that's a good feeling. Absolutely. That that, the the internal workings in our entire benefit. Yeah. And so, (laughs) yeah, to that point, when I was in early sobriety and my life was in shambles, when I heard someone talk about gratitude, it, I had a visceral reaction to that. I thought gratitude meetings were the dumbest thing I had ever heard. I thought this is some filler shit that y'all can't think anything else to talk about. God, another gratitude meeting. Yeah. Until I experienced what real gratitude felt like. Yeah, absolutely. Gratitude is the key. (laughs) It is. It's that simple. So if, if you're, (laughs) and I can't tell you how much of my life (laughs) is spent in this internal constant struggle over my higher self trying to tell my baser self, you're not being grateful. Right. Like you've got a (laughs) lot of awesome in your life that if it went away today, you would feel real bad about that. Yeah. No. Yeah. (laughs) It's this struggle between your higher man and your baser man fighting, trying to convince, you know, this, this feelingsy part of myself that wants to, you know, oh, I just want to go buy a new toy and I want right. this, that, and other, all these externals to make myself feel better. When the higher man is saying, you really need to grow gratitude. You're- yeah. But here's the, here's the deal. Gratitude is a practice. Absolutely. It takes. Without, a, without question. Practice. And it's the way that you build gratitude and you build, uh, you know, gratitude in your life is one tiny step at a time mm-hmm. just identifying just one thing oh man i'm re- i'm really in a hurry and I, I i never make it through this stoplight but today i made it through this stoplight that's really nice when you start identifying just stupid stuff like that 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 is completely random then you start Absolutely. building on that oh oh you start identifying so l- let me, things to be grateful for. Let me give you this little, little, I heard this, it was on some reel somewhere. And I think this reel was maybe about, I think they called it God. Anyway, here, okay, here it goes. Yeah. If I asked you, how many red cars did you pass on your way to work today? How many would you say? How many red cars did you notice on your way from your house to the studio today? I, I had no idea. No clue. Now, if I told you I will pay you $50 for every red car you recognize from your house to the studio next time you come here, what are you how's that going to impact your behavior? You're going to be on the lookout for everything that even approximates a red car. Yeah, and I just just so I get my $50. $50 per car. Per car. Per car, I would then I have a dash cam that I could install. Right. And I would <laughs> install said dash cam right. 
to properly identify all I've and do proof. Is, all I've got to do is find 10, 10 red cards from my dash cam and right. it paid for itself. Right. So that's how luck works. That's how right. gratitude works. If I'm looking for it, I will find it everywhere. Right. That's how, you know, people call it God winks or, you know, there are a million things that you hear about in, you know, kind of the self-help right. uh, genre that help you stay on the lookout for the good. Right. Because really, look, as a man thinketh, it's absolutely yeah, true. Yeah. As a man thinketh, so the man goes, or however right. the thing Again, The things that I look for magnify. If I'm looking for something to complain about, I will find no shortage. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Because look, old girl is all, look, the <laughs> wife is always talking back. Your kids are always arguing. I mean, there's always your boss is expecting too much and paying too little. And you're, you know, this, that, and there's yep. always something to complain about. Yeah. Absolutely. You will never have a shortage there. And part of this is the practice of recovery, mm -hmm. the practice of sobriety. You nailed it. Gratitude is a practice. How I'm, you know, just constant reminders to implement these things into my life and I will yield the result. Right. Period. Yeah. You know, I know. And I guess this episode is really for people that are all up in AA, but well, yeah, you know, the, the AA, the text says, rarely have we seen a man fail who has thoroughly followed our path. I promise you, you could take rarely out and make it never. Yeah. It works. It is evidenced by, you know, now on a century's worth of people getting sober. Right. I mean, AA is a, I mean, we're getting close to a hundred years old. It, it works. These things that we've talked about today will absolutely make your life better. Yeah. No question. I don't feel egotistical saying that. I didn't invent these things. Right. I didn't come up with them. I'm not trying to sell a book here. You just follow direction. I just follow the instructions. All right. I have more. Go on. Commence rewarding actions slash involvement. Okay. What I wrote was sponsorship mentorship, charity, volunteering. So this, this topic could really hyperlink into the higher good that we mentioned earlier with the spiritual spirituality. There is a higher good that is helping someone else. I don't understand really all of the magic, the psychological impact it has on us, but it helps. Absolutely. If I can think of myself less, and really what that means is if I can think of myself less often right. and more of my next man, more of the next woman, the next person, somehow you feel better in ways you never even knew you could feel better. Right. To do something for someone else where there's no immediate reward which is certainly contrary to how we engaged in our life when we were using makes us feel better. I don't know if it's because we feel like doing those things pleases the God of our organized religion upbringing. I don't know. It, it must have some evolutionary benefit. Like it causes higher production of dopamine or something, but you feel good. Yeah, And it helps you frame how you assess what's wrong in your life. Because if you talk to somebody who's truly hurting, you will go back home and think to yourself, thank God I'm not hurting that way. Right. I might not like the relationship I have with my kids, but I'm glad I don't have that. Right. I might not like some component of my marriage, but I'm glad I don't have that marriage. Right. I may not like my job, but I'm glad I've got one or glad I don't have that one. And there's also the, I mean, fundamentally the, the golden rule has its roots. In, I mean, the three major religions in the world are Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. And all three of them have some version of the golden rule. Do unto others as you would have done unto you, you know, judge by the same metric that you would want yourself judged. I mean, it, it's kind of an, yeah. a capstone to 
the social contract that governs the interactions between all people so that we can live a life. Right. Right. And there's something good about it that just makes us feel better. And it makes us feel better on a polyfaceted structure. I mean, we feel better internally. We feel like we're doing better. We feel we, we're less harsh in our judgment of our own lives. We're less harsh, less harsh in our critique of our own behavior. And so if you get out there and commence involvement in these areas, your life will improve. Right. You see it routinely. We talked about it before we got on air yeah. with the podcast. How many podcasts do you produce now right now right at 14 and you started those by not making any money i mean it was right. just a charitable endeavor because you bought into this idea that it feels good for me to help somebody else yeah now, yeah yeah so i mean there there is not a lot of money in podcasting i mean there can be when you're you know joe rogan joe rogan but or the Nelk boys or something. Right, right. But I, I am I am not in this to make money. I am in this because it feels good to help people. It do you feels, feel better about yourself? Absolutely. Like I'm absolutely. giving back. Like it's absolutely. I'm doing something that feels good enough right. that I am willing not to get high tonight so that I can do more of that thing tomorrow right yeah no it's it's and 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 you know to to what we were talking about right before the the podcast started you know i i have i have clients that that pay me pretty decent money you know and and i'm not gonna you know say no to that but well you have you've spent money to provide these things. yeah yeah i mean i've we, we've got a lot of money invested in in this studio but the the point is you know i there's something about helping someone else that is passionate about forming meaningful connections using the podcast platform, right? There's something about me catering to those people and helping, helping them do that on a, on a very high level that, that if I were getting paid for it, my fear is that I wouldn't enjoy it as much. It would feel more obligatory than it does blessing. Right, right. So you know, I'm I I I love I love what I do. I love helping people. I I love, you know, it's that's what this is all about. I mean, I'm I am not here to to make millions. You know, I am here to help other people learn, grow, become more confident with who they are as individuals, help them have a life, help them have a life. Or although I can't they take would like to be present. Right. Exactly. Now I can't obviously take credit for, you know, anything that they've done, but I, I can, God has provided every single penny that has gone into this with my other business. And so my goal now is to use those gifts to help as many people as I possibly can, because mm -hmm. that way I feel like I am, I'm doing God right. He's provided the mon the the money. I'm doing God right. I'm doing God right. I'm paying the cosmic debt. Right. And this is the genius of of the 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 beginning of twelve step of the twelve step program that by working together and offering the benefit we got to the next man for free, we will be healthier, bigger, better, stronger happier, more content. Right. Yeah. It's genius. Yeah. It's, it's, yeah, you, you gotta, you gotta, you gotta give it away to keep it. And, you know, that was something that I didn't really understand when I first came into the rooms, but it, it, it became very clear that there is something to that. Mm -hmm. And if, if I just go through life, just soaking up things from everyone and not giving anything back, eventually I'm going to, I'm going to be miserable. I'm miserable. going to be you know, you've got to give, I have to give it away in order for me to be able it's to. It's our be, mandate. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I, because it was offered free to you. Right. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So it's, you know, I love, I love that aspect of the program. Trust God, clean house, help others. You know, you, you got to, I have to help others in order for me to, to feel right, you know? And that's something that, you know, when I was in active addiction, are you kidding me? Like, well, 
that's not completely true. I, I liked to think of myself as a good person and that I did nice things for other people, but the motives in everything that I did was always, and, and, and this is an appropriate time to use a generalization statement. I always was doing that nice thing to butter that person up to where I, when I needed something from them, I wouldn't feel guilty about cashing in, mm -hmm. you know, it was never, you know, I'm just going to, I'm just going to do this. Cause I'm a nice guy. I was not a nice guy, you know, it was a calculating. Yeah, I was. It, yeah, absolutely. And, and everything that I did was calculated and, you know, <laughs> was viewed through the lens. What can this person do for me? Yeah, laid. absolutely. And that's a dark place. That's a dark way to live. It's a dark way to live. It is today. I, I, I strive to just be nice because I want people to be nice to me and treat people the way that I would like them to treat me. And it's just that simple. And in everything that I do quickly and aggressively identify where I can be grateful and how I can be grateful for this thing that's going on right now. <laughs> that is the number one thing. If I can do that every single day, man, I'm golden. If I can identify the, Look, the, like the positive. Like Cormac McCarthy says, you never know what worse luck your bad luck saved you from. Absolutely. And one thing that I'm really grateful for today is the awareness that I may have had a past and some consequences that I view as bad luck, but I am supremely aware of there was worse luck that I was saved from. Absolutely. And view my consequences like that now. Right. You know, trying to look, keep at it. It ain't easy. No. Being sober requires some work and you have to face some things that you probably aren't eager or keen on facing. Right. But if you stick with it, the benefits are amazing. Yeah, absolutely. There's, you know, and it, and it can always get worse. We've we've touched on I this. I sure you can. <laughs> it can always, it can and will always. Every time. Get worse. Without fail. Yeah, the yets. I, I haven't done that yet. I haven't yeah. experienced that yet. Well, you will. You will. Just keep digging. Keep digging and you'll experience those yets. I promise you that. So it's, you know, today we, we just have to, we got to, we got to practice gratitude and we got to. We, we got to practice gratitude. That's the, that's the, that's the bottom line. And cool for us though, that we get to sit here and talk about these things. And then I have, you know, days of interesting things that I think about. Yeah. And I mean, just, I mean, it's no, it's no secret. I mean, I, I guess I kind of think myself a lot, um, <laughs> but man, what a, it's a good day. Yeah. It's a gift. I, even if nobody listens to this episode, well, it's been good for me, and I right now we have seventy two thousand three hundred and sixty two people watching. Y'all are right all now. blessed. <laughs> you get a car. You get a car. You, you get, get a car. <laughs> <laughs> get it, Oprah. <laughs> yeah, but it, it's you know if 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 I can practice gratitude in my life, my life is going to be damn fine. Mm -hmm. You know, and there there are going to be hard times. There are going to be hard times, but if I'm quick to identify. Okay, so this is something that's really, really difficult that's that's happening right now. My first thought today is, okay, how can I learn from this? How can I grow from this? And I think you do a good job of that. Well, really. I appreciate that. That that is my and that takes practice too. You know, it's you know, I, I could you God, have to be intentional about it. Yes. I mean, God forbid this this is a honest to God thought. God forbid for most people getting the news that you have cancer is is devastating it is devastating and it's it's the 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 end of an era it can be horrible news but the way that i feel right now and and again god forbid this happens what the rooms of alcoholics anonymous and the tools that the program has provided and all i've done is use those tools the way that i feel about that receiving devastating news God, my, look, God, we're not trying to test that. No, 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 no. But my my first thought would be, you know what? I'm going to bring some light when I'm getting my chemo treatments. I'm gonna I'm gonna help someone 
because I know that God is bringing me through this for a reason. So what can I do to make this a positive experience? And I could be puking nonstop with those chemo treatments. And I would still, you know, this is the way I feel now. It might be different if it was actually happening. I would still be trying to identify, okay, God, how can I use this? I feel like crap right now, but how can I be used? Use me, use me, use me. Yeah. And it's, it's all about being grateful for what we have. And having that mindset. Right. Because tough times are going to come. Absolutely. When you're in recovery. You're, Absolutely. You're, the, there will be the first time you deal with fill in the blank when you're in recovery yep. because sobriety is not going to immunize you from bad things. Right. You're going to be confronted with feelings of fear, feelings of loss, feelings of guilt, shame, remorse. You're going to be reminded of something. You're going to be somewhere that reminds you of something and you're going to trigger the character defects that we all have. Right. And so it's going to happen. It, it's going to happen. Yeah. And the hope is that we have a system in place, a network of support and a framework for how to deal with it when it comes along. Yep. Because that thing that really gets you, whatever it is, is going to happen again. Yeah. You know, if you're, you know, if you've, I'm trying to think of a good example here. It'll come to me later. Yeah. I yeah. don't know. I'm running out. No, I think good? I'm tapped out for today. Yeah. Okay. That's totally cool. Yeah. I, I, you know, it's again, to, to recap the, if, if there's one thing that you take away from this, it is do the work to begin to identify how you can be for the things that you can be grateful for in your life. Start small and, and, and build, build upon that. And, and it's practice. It takes work. And when you, when you hear someone say, Oh, I'm so grateful for this. Like, no, believe them. They're not, they're not necessarily lying. That's just where they are at life. And that can happen to you too. And if it, you do the work, and you are worth the effort. Absolutely. 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 Well, this has been really, this has been a treat for me and I, I, I love, I love having this platform to, to be able to, to talk and connect with people you know, we, we're, uh, Drew and I are incredibly grateful for all the, holy moly, 82,764 people that are watching it's right now. And it's a, it's a Christmas miracle. Yeah. <laughs> so thank you all to up oh, 90,000. Incredible. Thank you all. I almost uh, feel guilty for cutting it off. Now. <laughs> yeah. You got, you got to end on the top, right? So Absolutely. So thank you everyone for joining us and being... episode 69 in the book. <laughs> giggity, giggity, go. <laughs> <laughs>